introduction to one of my favorite people on earth, Mr. Stephen Oliver, who is with the Advisor Marketing Podcast. Now, Stephen is a true maverick, and I mean that in every sense of the word, not only in our business, but I have to tell you, his clients universally love him, and they grow at rates that they wouldn't believe it's possible. Now, on this podcast, in each episode, Stephen is joined by various members of his team or special guests to share insider secrets to rapid growth and high net profits in your financial advisory practice. So I just want you to know you're in for a wild ride, new information, and a lot of exciting new future because of Stephen Oliver. Anyway, hey, we'll get uh, we'll, we'll get we'll get started here. Uh, we're going to be talking today about uh, direct mail marketing for financial advisors. And hey, Justin, I'm gonna I'm gonna let you give uh, uh, mostly introduce yourself. Uh, are are you Profit Nine One One or or now Jurassic uh, Marketing? That's a good question now, isn't it? So we're in the middle of a brand switch over. So Jurassic Marketing is a book I wrote about direct mail. Profit Nine One One is the company, and there is overlap. So. You know, if people think of dinosaurs and me, I'm good with that. So we'll say Jurassic Marketing for now. Okay, there you go. And and uh, the the book that you put together is Profit 911. You know, before we go any further, can they get hold of the book? Is it on Amazon? Do you have a link? Uh, yeah, Jur Jurassic Marketing is live on Amazon now. If you'd prefer a free copy, just uh, reach out to me. We'll share some contact info in the show notes here at the end. Okay. Uh, so the book is called Jurassic Marketing. Yes, sir. Jurassic Marketing. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. There you go. Um, tell everybody the backstory about where, where you came up with the, the uh, concept of Jurassic marketing for a firm that specializes in direct mail. Yeah. So the funny part is we weren't always direct mail. This company, Profit 911, started as a digital marketing agency, much like uh, many others. We, we took a turn, though, about... 2020, 2021, and it had nothing to do with the unnamed disease. <laughs> um, we took a turn to direct mail and only direct mail because it was working better than anything else for us. We were getting better results for our clients. Uh, so at some point, we we flipped the switch, went all in and said, okay, this is what we do. Let's forget everything else. But I haven't forgotten everything else. So we're not stupid when it comes to other media. Uh, however, we've dug deep, deep into serving people with uh, direct mail of many sorts. We'll dig into a few different types today. Um, but yeah, it's been a 10-year genesis from marketing agency serving primarily marketing automation uh, all the way over to being just cog in the wheel, one media, direct mail. And again, the reasons because we're winning more with it. Yeah. Uh, it Our works. And here is to accelerate small business growth by executing winning marketing campaigns. And this is what was winning. So we're like, hmm, the world is trying to tell us something. Yeah. <laughs> and since then, we mail millions of pieces a year for uh, a variety of different industries. Yeah. You, you know, um, probably three standards that I, I, I tell my clients, whether they're financial advisors or in other niches, is one email. Uh, the average person is annoyed by the time they check their email and it has 200 emails in their inbox on an average day, the likelihood of getting to their inbox, the likelihood of getting open, the likelihood of them being in a good mood when they read, you know, when they read your email are all, all, all kind of working against you. And on the flip side, in the in the mailbox, the physical mailbox, there's maybe four pieces of mail a, a day in their mailbox, maybe with the holidays as a rare exception with still Christmas catalogs and so forth. But one, your likelihood of, of penetrating that. Number two, I can't tell you how many times over the years, going back 40 years, People told me they had gotten, whether it was a, a newsprint ad or a postcard or a letter, and it had gone under the magnet on the on the uh, 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 refrigerator or that was stacked on their desk. And, and three months later, six months later, nine months later, they pulled it out. So the advantage of something physically getting to people as opposed to digital, where digital just disappears, you know, it's basically unlikely that anybody ever prints out a text or prints out an a <laughs> email and, 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 and holds on to it um, is, is, is the second thing, but pick up, pick up from there. What, what. Yeah. Look, look, there's a couple of benefits we get, and this, this is the crux of why it works. There's, there's deeper conversations and maybe we'll go there, but number one is it gets the attention. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cause nothing else matters if we don't have the attention to start with. So the mail comes today. I actually was the one that got at the office today, which is weird, but there are two boxes, one letter. That's it. Um, yeah. I've had more than three emails come in since we started and hit record here. 
Um, I just presented a few weeks ago at Joe Polish's Genius Network on stage and uh, I did a survey I haven't done before. How many of those of you in the room, your iPhone right now says over 500 for the notifications for email? There were quite a few of them. You know what happens if 500 letters are in your mailbox at home? Like there's like human beings pounding on your door saying, hey, what's wrong with you? Are you still alive? Yeah. So we get that. Uh, so we get attention. The second benefit is you get trust just out of the gate, which unfair to an extent, you know, just because you mailed something doesn't mean you're legitimate. However, because people receive that and they somewhere in their psyche know that that costs money, and particularly if it's repetitive, you instantly get more trust out the gate than you would from an email. So even for a cold outreach, which we'll talk a little about, um, you've overcome a little bit of the trust hurdle leading to a sale. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's let, let's let's go into some some practical um, uses of this. I I tend to start with um, financial advisors. With one is they all think that most of their traffic is going to come from referrals. Oftentimes, they tell me everybody that, that they work with comes from referrals. But then the reality is, is when I ask them how many out, you know, how many touches do you have on your clients on a monthly basis, on a yearly basis, they start telling me about meeting them live in person twice a year. And, and that, you know, that tends to be about it. Um, and, and I always start with a recommendation. Well, you should at least once a month have a newsletter going out to them. You should at least uh, once a month have some other communication going out physically in the mail to them. You should, if you're, if you're emailing to them, it should be daily, maybe three times a week at the least. But I, I, I see advisors who legitimately think they're getting their clients are all referring their friends, their uh, co-workers, their associates. When I could take a bet and call a hundred of them, I bet, I bet if I said, who's your financial advisor, 60% of them couldn't pull up a name on the top of their head. Ooh, uh, scary. So, yeah, scary. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I used to have a presentation I gave called, uh, it had the myth of the all referral business in it. Um, because there's some industries we work with that it's a point of pride that they're completely yeah. referral, 100% referral or doing, quote, no marketing. Mm -hmm. And uh, the counterpoint to that always was, that's amazing. You did the hardest thing first. Now, if we throw a little marketing fuel on the fire, it should explode. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, the, the referrals and the clients, you know, it's not where people come to me wanting to start. So this is a conversation that's repeated multiple times a day by our campaign managers here. Everyone wants new leads. That's, yeah. that's what they come looking for. And most of the time we find lower hanging fruit doing other things first. And the very first one is dealing with current clients. Yeah. And yeah, our recommended prescription is one that you already mentioned. And that is client newsletters are the easiest, cheapest, uh, most consistent touch point in the mail. And they team up with email nicely. Yeah. Um, but at least that gives you one piece in the mailbox every single month, which can help warm a relationship, maintain a relationship, and ultimately keep you top of mind for the referral if they're a current client. Now, if anyone's already referring, they should also be on there. But, you know, that's oftentimes where we start. And it's it's not sexy. Like people aren't like overly thrilled about <laughs> producing a newsletter. It's kind of a pain in the butt. We, we help make it not one. Um, but I believe it's the single easiest, cheapest thing to do. And, and the math almost always works. So financial advisors, the, the math is easy. I'll give you a Terrible counterpoint, which was the first industry I was ever in, which was wedding entertainment. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I ran a wedding disc jockey company for 20 years of all things. And we had a client newsletter. I, I practiced this way before we were selling this as a service offering. And by and large, weddings were a one-off client. Yeah. You know, they may get married again. We had a couple. It's, it's an anomaly, not the regular, that they'd hire back. Because we were a high-end provider, typically they, they wouldn't go high-end again. Um, however, we left them on our newsletter list forever until they disappeared. We couldn't find the new house. They got divorced and it was a pain point and they didn't want to receive it or something like that. Because the math worked out that if they referred one person every 40 years, it would profit. And that was for like a $2,000 sale. So think of what a client's worth to you. Uh, this particular tactical piece of direct mail probably is a no brainer. Oh yeah. Well, uh, you know, for, for a, a, a fee-based advisor, 
if if they got a referral with a, a million dollars uh, assets under management, uh, they're more or less going to make uh, gross one percent of that. So you can run the numbers pretty easily. If the lifetime value of a new client's a hundred thousand dollars, it's very hard not to justify throwing a lot of things at uh, uh, referrals and so forth. Uh, what, what one of the other um, uh, key marketing tools that I've seen for referrals is uh, sharing with your own clients pass along tools. And what I think of as a pass along tool is you write the book and they all get uh, a financial advisor that I, I didn't work with, but I, I, I knew he actually got to the point of putting together a small book once a quarter and then mailing them all to his, his clients. Uh, but a, a comparable to that is a five page report on uh you know, uh, um, college uh, planning, a five-page report on uh, whatever it might be, when you should retire uh, um, and take Social Security the first time. You know, there's any number of, of topics. Uh, but that's another thing where right, right down your 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 alley is is putting together those reports, mailing five or six of them to each client, uh, a, a cover note that says, uh, I just put this together. I thought you might find it valuable. I also sent it by email as a PDF, but a lot of times a physical copy is more useful. Uh, feel free to pass along to your friends, that type of thing. Yeah, this is desk and coffee table stuff, stuff that yeah. they feel bad throwing away when they get it. You bet. And, and it will stick around a certain amount of time. Uh, magazine's another good one for it too. However, a, a lot higher uh, burden to put together. Um, books, magazines, booklets, reports, sales pitches disguised as reports, yeah. all those things have a long shelf life. And this is not necessarily going to someone that doesn't know you. That would probably have a very short shelf life. But if they know you, they'll they'll keep that around and, and given the opportunity, we'll pass that out. Um, you can expand that one also beyond clients to anyone that has the ability to refer you. Um, so other providers, professional services that they're consuming, uh, anyone that may be in a relationship with your client at the point they need your service, uh, as long as the piece has sufficient value, you'd want to go a little higher up the food chain if it's a little colder, like a book or a longer content piece. Um, but those would stick around and those pay dividends for, I mean, we've had calls from pieces like that 18 months later, and it yeah. kind of surprises me. But uh, yeah, those things stick around. So make sure whatever you're writing in those uh, is kind of evergreen. You know, it's not not what's going on right now in 2024. It's it's uh, good advice that at least opens a conversation for you. Yeah, just a, a couple of years ago, I got a I got a new client from a book that he had. I don't know if I if we had sent it out for free or if he had bought it, but he had bought the book five years earlier, and then was in in crisis, um, and uh, went back to his bookshelf and and basically said, "Well, I guess that guy might know how to help me," and ended up coming coming back. Um, I, I did a, um, um, a, a, a survey of our own clients and this, this is a, you know, indicative it's not, is not, a, a, a across industries, but I said, how long had you been following me before you ever ended up actually as, as a client? And we had one that was 12 years, one that was seven, uh, you know, any number that were four five, three years. And, and I think that everybody perceives that. They're going to if they get a prospect, they raise their hand, they're either interested or not interested. And then you're you're on to the next person. And I think the reality is, you know, when the timing is right, many people who you don't get right away will come back to you. Uh, you you were ref, uh, uh, talking about circle of influence marketing. And I'll, I want to go back also to prospect follow up. But in, in industry jargon, in a circle of influence marketing, let, let's talk about that, because that is is incredibly important is getting to influencers. I think a lot of financial advisors only see that as maybe uh, CPAs or attorneys. I look at it, uh, you know, for my own businesses, the influencers that that we got to were people on the on the news channels that ended up getting us publicity. They were um, uh, promotional director for the Denver Broncos and the, or the CFO for the Denver Broncos, the promotional director for the Denver Nuggets. There were all kinds of opportunities that opened up with with the big major sports teams. It was the uh, human resources director for the largest employer in the state at the time, uh, a marketing director for the uh, second largest employer. So, you know, if if, if I were going to be dripping valuable information, newsletter, et cetera, to influencers, heck, I'd be going to the C-suite executives of all the top employers in my area. I'd be going to anybody who's 
um, you know, both those those standard circle of influence types, the tax attorneys and the, you know, and the CPAs. But I'd I'd be shooting for getting in front of the big associations, the big organizations. If you're niched, going to the uh, uh, the leaders in the big organizations that are within your niche. But let's yeah, you, you may uh, have a mixed bag, right? Yep. And, and this is a bit of an effort question. You know, how much effort do you want to put into it? What's each opportunity worth? Um, certainly, you can chase them. I wouldn't negate the traditional uh, circle of influence ones because there's a ton of CPAs. Now, the math is a little different. Uh, and you know, you have to introduce yourself and it's often a game of waiting then, mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned prospect marketing and follow up too. It's the same game there, by the way. So it's being there when something occurs outside of your control, you can't cause it to happen. You can't accelerate it, but you need to be there when the opportunities arisen. Um, mm -hmm. uh, most obvious example you see in a different industry is like the personal injury attorneys, the car wreck guys, right? Sure. They're everywhere. Yeah. Um, but to the part of the world that matters to you, that has to be you. And, you know, sometimes that waiting game is four years if the relationship's worth it. Um, we have a lot of people like that. It's just that that thing you're trying to crack that, you know, that person, when they stop referring Joe down the street and they refer me, you know, that's worth 10 clients a year. You know, those relationships take actual time, trust forever. And mail is one way to stay in front and, and be there probably yeah. the least obtrusive way. I mean, the email is less obtrusive, but gets no impact. Yeah. Um, all you're trying to do is, you know, be readily available when whatever happens, you know, divorce, death, you know, you got the, the list in financial advisor world, but yeah. Yeah. Cheap, easy. And this doesn't have to be complicated, by the way, like direct mail. If people go down the wormhole, they, they start learning about copywriting they start learning about split testing. They start learning about a lot of things that for a professional service provider, you probably don't even need to know about mm -hmm. because you don't have a lot of competition. Yeah. Particularly in this media. Oh, yeah. Just yeah. being there and not screwing up from a marketing angle is probably good enough. As much as I hate to say it as an agency owner, um, this is the table stakes. <laughs> oh, yeah. You don't have to go crazy beyond that. Well, it, it, when it comes to prospect follow up, um, you know, it, it, Justin, as, as you can imagine, I, uh, in 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 this industry, I have gone and and researched everybody I can possibly research, and have played prospects with anyone I can come across, you know, on the on the high end of the stakes, uh, Ken Fisher and so forth, and all the big companies and the local guys, and, and I tell people often there's only one advisory firm that I've ever played prospect with that is good, and. What I what I mean by that is there's a um, and I'm not pulling their name off the top of my head here, but there's a a, a local uh, firm, pretty good sized firm, best I could tell. I, I I don't know them personally, but I played prospect on their list, and suddenly I'm getting invites to events and to different things that they're doing, and they're having the the special holiday uh, fundraiser. I'm invited to. I'm getting a um, I believe it's monthly. I haven't really kept kept too much track but i'm getting a monthly newsletter from them and it's very interesting and mostly it's about the personal experiences of the different advisors of the community outreach things they're doing is not very much technical stuff uh but i'm i'm periodically getting really nicely done invitations to to some meeting that they're having uh for me to attend uh so probably two or three times a month i'm getting something physically in the mail uh it's it's very nice it's very well done and that's out of you know, at, at the lowest hundreds, if not thousands of, of playing prospects and playing prospects at the at the uh, the high end with the biggest direct mark, you know, marketing response, direct response marketing people. And and by the way, when I when I play prospects, if they ask, I always tell them I'm highly qualified. You know, I mean, I, the, the you know, the self-reported numbers should get their get their attention. Um, and um, it, it is interesting to me, it, it, as far as being that uh, only one doing it, that's a, such, such a true statement. You stand out so much uh, from the crowd. If, and I don't think most prospects do much shopping, but if they do shop, if they, if they, if they have shopped, you're the only one they're going to remember even uh, visiting if you're dripping in their mailbox all the time. Yeah, you're right. I mean, a trust-based sale, so anything we can do to, to boost the referrals is number one. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be 10 times easier than than cold marketing, which also can be done. Yeah, you know, I've received the Fisher packet as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm guessing the ones that did follow up, you probably some of them, you probably got a nice 
pocket folder or book or something in the mail, maybe one more follow-up piece and then disappeared into the abyss. That, that would be my guess. Yeah. Uh, r- r- rarely even that, to tell you yeah. the truth. Um, um, but, but you're absolutely right. You know, e- even the, you know, I haven't been too charitable about it. I, I call it the bozo explosion of consultants, but even among the, the, the quote unquote gurus, right. Uh, when you order something from them or, or uh, order information about their deal, other than being, you know, the never ending series of email, it's just so rare uh, that you get any follow up at all. I, uh, I, I don't know how many times I've gotten the big packet the first time, as you mentioned, and then nothing ever again. And, and with, with many of them, I had the best of intentions of, of following through with them. It's just out of sight, out of mind. Um, you know, they're, maybe they're emailing me and it's not getting through or I, I, I'm not paying any attention. In fact, my email has an autoresponder basically says piss off. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I stole the idea from Tim Ferriss years ago and oh, yeah. basically, <laughs> basically it redirects them to everybody. And, um, you know, and I, I added in a Monty Python clip of, of I'm not dead yet, but <laughs> so with, with, uh, um, let's go to the other end of the spectrum a little bit, cause it is where people start, you know, the, their, their efforts, We're not, which I think is usually the, the wrong end of the spectrum to start on. Talk about what you've seen work and not work on, on cold. It's Lee Milt here, and I'm delighted to interrupt you today and let you know that I've been working with Stephen Oliver for 10 or 15 years now. He's a great guy. I love all the research that he does. And I just wanted to let you know that if you're enjoying the content on this podcast, then you really want to make time to visit advisorwealthmastery.com. And Why should you do that? Well, because you're going to receive two of his great books and actually one of mine called Success is an Inside Job. You'll also get a lot of absolutely free material on growing your practice through effective marketing. So again, take the time to go to advisorwealthmastery.com. Lead generation. Yeah. So this is what what everyone comes asking. And by and large, we talk them out of it as a first and second and almost third step. Um, we see traditional, I mean, we see seminar marketing still work if you're willing to put in the effort. Uh, it's a, a tough game and grind. However, it, it still has legs. Um, we see what we call two-step lead gen working, which is you are requesting something, be it a book, a report, something like that. Uh, I believe the Fisher kid I got was the same. That was a cold outbound. Yeah. Um, no idea what we get, what the criteria was really more than half of the success of cold outreach is going to be the list. Mm-hmm. So you really have to define who you work with and who's a good client or prospect for you might be different than another listener to this podcast. And the more you can define that out, the better, because then we work with our list brokers and, and we try and find these people. So you'd mentioned niches a couple of times already. So, you know, is there a particular profession that you work with better than others or have people willing to say nice things, even if they're not allowed to? <laughs> um, income is a qualifier, but a lot of people overly rely on that metric to find their list and it, it doesn't end up meaning a whole lot. You know, home value is the same. You know, there's there's just dozens of criteria we can look at. However, if you can nail in who you want to work with more, um, that really helps because then we can write an authentic message in that opening piece that hopefully has more connection than just, hey, I'm good at what I do. I, I know the right way to manage your money for the maximum return and safety. Um, yeah. Everyone's saying that. So if yeah. we can come in with, Hey, I'm local. Uh, my kids go to this school district. You know, it depends what we know about the prospect. Uh, you know, if they have kids or not, we're using kids for sure. Yeah. Um, but anything like that really helps. So this becomes a game of focus down. Yeah. Uh, everyone, uh, when they first get into learning about this, they start talking percentage ROI, particularly if you're like a high compliance type thinker, um, yeah. which likely if you ended up in this industry, there's part of your personality there. 
Um, but they start getting stuck in percentage world. Like, hey, I can get this list of 50,000 people around me. If I get a half a percent to have consultations and then, you know, two thirds of them become clients. So all of a sudden I'm rich overnight and that's just not the way it works. Yeah. Um, so now that I mentioned it, let me tell you about response percentage. Yeah, you hear 1%, 2% thrown around a lot. However, I really want to see that maybe one-tenth of 1% is a slam dunk. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just for inquiring. That's not for becoming a client. Uh, if you're using your prospect list with an offer, uh, you might have 30% response. So the percent is completely irrelevant in my world. However, if we're going out cold, I want to see that a fraction of 1% makes a difference to you. Yeah. Otherwise, it's probably not worth playing the game. You bet. You bet. Well, and and the you were you were mentioning niche. What I always tell people is is um, uh, advisors specifically is they're much better off to very narrowly target the who, yep. and so that they can rifle shot, they can communicate in their language, they can be right on target with exactly who that person is. But then broaden the geography, and and they seem to start with narrow geography and and a uh, uh, very little idea of who it is they want you know i i i've asked 100 advisors who they target they say well uh 50 to 60 years old with half a million or more in investable assets well you know there's no commonality whatsoever in that right there's the 57 year old widow there's the um you know the uh, high-end thoracic surgeon there's the uh, uh general contractor they don't speak the same language. They're not in the same vein. They don't have the same needs. They don't have the same concerns. Um, they're, 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 there's just very little commonality there other than age. And that's not even much of a commonality nowadays. As as we both know, there are people who are 65 and think like they're 35. And there's people who are who are 57 and think they're, you know, they got one foot in the grave and maybe they do. Um, so when you're when you're targeting, it really helps to go through that definition. And a lot of times what uh, I know in your world and in my world, what we do is go find what magazines do people very narrowly targeted read. And even if the magazine subscriptions are down, oftentimes they have a big mailing list. They have a big uh, um, website, email, but oftentimes they have a very targeted uh, mailing list that you can go for or find other things that they purchase and find a, a targeted list. Um, and you know, the first thing that, that most people don't understand the difference of is what a compiled list is, what a response list is, a subscriber list, and, and be able to to narrow those things down. Um, see, if it were me, I'd much rather the 100 FedExes go out with a personal letter, you know, looks handwritten with a, a personal signature to a very targeted list than do the 5,000 that, that are, you know, a, over half a million investable assets, over 50, that's not going to be at all on target for them. Yeah, I mean, one of the easy first lists is more along the lines of what you're saying they're already doing. But if you take your current client database, um, you can upload it to a mapping software and just start pinpointing and seeing if, hey, we have a disproportionate amount of people right here. Let's mail this neighborhood. So that can work. That's an easy one. Um, then yes, we start going a little further out and you have, if you get stuck in list world without someone helping you, it's, you're going to have a hard time escaping list world. You'll just have, you know, death by a thousand cuts of indecision, yeah. um, because we can, we can go by affinities. What do they like to do? You know, what do they subscribe to? Uh, what do they identify as politically? You know, all that's available. And then there's more the demographic type list, which is, okay, I want within a five mile radius of my office, ages 50 to 60, income of this, have lived in their home five years, just uh, things that are basic public knowledge. Yeah. And it's a different type of database. Now you can overlay them and get crazy like that. But honestly, we're probably getting deeper in the weeds than most people in any professional services business need to get uh, for at least version one, two, and three. You bet. Uh, obviously you can continue to test and go once you see a glimmer of light. Um, and now that I mentioned glimmer of light, let me mention that that's usually the goal of your first mailing. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to put something in the mail, put a quantity and a budget that is gambling money, mm -hmm. um, investment, yes, but gambling, and you're not necessarily looking for a client or two or three on your first mailing. You're looking for some sort of response. 
Mm -hmm. did I make something happen in the world? Did someone email? Did, did they ask a question? Yeah, that that's the goal of the first mailing a lot of times. Of course, everyone wants more clients at the end of the day, and that's the ultimate goal. But um, we're, we're looking for, are people even listening? Yeah. You know? Because if we goose egg and there's nothing, we have to make drastic changes before we try again. There's no split testing. It's okay. We're going to shift a lot of stuff now because we missed completely. Yeah. And the list is probably where we'd start with changing. Right. Right. The, the, let, let's, let's go back to uh, away from cold prospecting back to uh, prospect follow-up. Mm -hmm. You know, I, 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 over the last, um, I don't know, four or five years have almost completely shifted, um, the vast majority of my efforts to ongoing, never ending prospect follow-up and ongoing, never ending, meaning, you know, I, if I get a new prospect in my funnel, they'll, they'll likely get 12 pieces of mail in the mailbox in the first 90 days and they'll get a big package. They'll get, uh, they may get popcorn or cookies and a, and a, and a personal note or something like that, but then they'll be on the mailing list forever. And, uh, I've had any number of just recently client reactivations that were people who had been gone five years, seven years, 10 years, 12 years. And it's just, we never, ever, ever took them off the list. And then at the beginning of the year, we, uh, uh, we went really hard with, you know, heavy 3d type of mail, dimensional mail, um, you know, stuff that stands out. I know you love to hate the, uh, you know, the handwritten machines, but you know, that type of thing. We have them. We have them. <laughs> yeah. 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 That, that, <laughs> that, well, while we're at tell people what some of the capabilities that, that you have in-house or some of the things you can facilitate. Yeah. So, I mean, we've been kind of talking about batched mail and that's what a lot of people think of when they start outsourcing mail. Maybe they've tried something and they're just tired of stuffing envelopes. However, there's one-off offerings as well, where you trigger time pieces to a unique individual via your CRM or spreadsheet if you're low tech, but hopefully a CRM. Yeah. Um, and we can provide that as well. So everything can be automated to where you're not touching it. Um, we can do, uh, we're out of Dan Kennedy world, so shock and awe packages, but we yeah. can do, you know, physical stuff as well. And and we warehouse and ship that out of Illinois. Uh, we do have handwriting as well. So we use cards where they're justified. Uh, the per piece cost on that significantly higher than most other pieces. So you have to use those where they matter. Yeah. Um, you can do simulated handwriting a heck of a lot cheaper than pen on paper. Yeah. Um, our kind of niche in direct mail world is making things look like personal correspondence. Okay. So we have two, two major products that go out the door here. Newsletters which we talked about and letters designed to get open because they look like a human being wrote them and is, is cost efficiently as we can get a piece like that out the door is kind of the specialty. Now, we do a lot of miscellaneous stuff for a lot of people. It's probably not worth digging into what we can do, but those, those are the two that we do the most of because, you know, we just see the results quicker. Yeah. Yeah. So to 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 hone in on on the uh, one of those statements is if somebody has an effectively set up CRM, they could set it up where every new lead comes in, that data gets fed over to you and whatever mechanism is most efficient. Uh, you can then put into the mail uh, a custom looking piece um, as it comes in. So rather than, you know, many mail houses, and I, and I know there's been a lot of evolution, but it used to be like 5,000 was their, their threshold, right? Um, and so you can do one, one off pieces, you can do a, a short run. Uh, a lot of what I try to get people to do is the, is the, the CRM kicks it off and we do the you know, the sequential follow-up and then, and then they have trouble finding people who will do that, do it effectively or, or, you know, or, or do it cost effectively. So you, you're set up in-house to be able to do all that kind of stuff for them. Yeah. So the, the one-off CRM triggered, uh, we can tie into all kinds of software packages to make that happen. Uh, and hundreds, if not thousands of those go out a day. They're interesting to watch come off the presses because like every piece is different and I don't know how they keep track of it back there, but they do. Yeah. Um, Batched is the other option, which is traditionally what you're thinking of. We have very small quantity minimums for that, even though I think it's 100 pieces. So even batches can be small. The real difference between those two offerings is customer service. Right. You know, human being on the batch side, on the one-off side, will will help you get it set up if need be. But it's completely automated on both sides, yours and mine after that. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, see, that's a that, that's an important. Um, you know, to me, it's the biggest thing that people make is they spend all their time generating leads and they do a horrible job following up. And uh, I, I I also think the you know the online marketing world the trend has been to get people to collect an email address, maybe a phone number, but not a mailing address. And as you know, email email addresses change all the time. Um, you know, I love to have a phone number so I can put a human being on calling them. We're doing uh, a huge amount of outbound calls, but the, having that physical address keeps you having the ability without a human being being engaged of dripping on them all the time. Uh, if it, it, this is an unfair question, but kind of in the range, if I'm, if I'm doing a, a, a CRM, uh, postcard that goes out or a letter, you know what? Are, what's somebody gonna 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 uh, um, uh, spend to get a follow up to a prospect like that? Yeah, a letter, postcard. I mean, we just figure a dollar a piece yeah. or take. You know, if you're yeah. trying to budget in round numbers, just figure yeah. a dollar to have something in the mail. Yeah, which which given the the uh, client value is just trivial amount of money, right? So if I was if I was generating a hundred prospects a month, and I did uh, four or five follow ups per prospect. You know, I'm I'm doing five hundred dollars in in follow up. Oftentimes, we see the cost of the lead being five hundred dollars. So why wouldn't you spend that to 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 follow up on on all of them, much less uh, any individual one? Yeah, it doesn't take much. I mean, you got to gather the mailing address as you alluded to, uh, yeah. or hunt it down your own afterwards. Um, and the online argument always is, you know, the more information I require, the less likely they are to fill it out. Yeah okay, you know, you, you can check your own stats and see if it's worth it or not. Yeah. Uh, but you can bypass that all by giving them a legitimate reason you need it, like mm -hmm. something that actually has to be sent out, some sort of gift or something or book. Yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, you know, serious prospects will fill it out. They don't, they don't care. Yeah. Well, and we've done uh, a, a lot that were two, two stage, right? So the first the first one, ask them for their email address, phone number, the second page, ask them for their address. Uh, uh, maybe there's an additional offer on the second page where it offers them a free book or something like that. Maybe the free book is you're going to get the PDF and then now I'd like to mail it to you, you know, give me a address. There's any number of ways to get that. But I, I really just, I really agree with the first thing you said, serious prospects don't bail out on the, on the form. And why are you going to waste your time with a bunch of people who, you know, are sitting in the dentist office and hit, you know, uh, submitted the Facebook form without even thinking about what the what the thing was, as opposed to somebody who's really uh, serious about what you're throwing at them. Yeah, I mean, I was just shopping for a sauna and had to fill out a form that had a mailing address. And I'm still waiting for something to show up and it better, but yeah. <laughs> it better be a piece of wood or something to smell. I don't know. <laughs> um, but I, people are protective of their information until there's a reason not to be. You bet. Okay, so I have an extreme separation between work and personal life here but uh, financial advisors you're in their personal life you're not in their work life already so it makes yeah. sense yeah. Um, I, I don't think you're going to get a whole hell of a lot of pushback uh you'd be amazed some of the information we're able to collect from people when we're asking for ourselves um, at the time they're actually on your website if that's where they're going or a landing page they've already made a decision to actively get more information you know that landscape has changed people's willingness to be identified is now later in the sales process you know they've likely already done some homework before you even know who they are via response so at the point they're responding they'll give you what you ask for um that's another reason why we should provide landing pages which i guess as an aside real quick here anytime we do a, a mailing campaign cold with a decent amount of money behind it, you need a landing page. Um, yes, they're going to bleed off a little bit. But the reason we do that is because if you don't and you're trying to track this hardcore and you're like, I'm just putting this tracking phone number and that's it. If you do that, uh, Google's going to provide the landing page for them <laughs> and everyone else's that comes up when they Google you. So, yeah. Yeah. Should, yeah. should we talk about tracking a little? I think we have time. Yeah, go, go right ahead. Yeah, we, we're good. Yeah. So, I mean, at the end of the day, what matters is dollars in the bank and, and phones ringing or emails. However, that's like step six of response. Step yeah. one was that glimmer of light, like I said. And and the quickest, easiest way to do that is tracking URL, mm -hmm. so a different .com, 
And by the way, I don't care if it dumps back to your main website. I mean, it should be a landing page, but let's at least get a tracking mechanism in play. QR codes are actually working now. You know, they they came out and disappeared and now they're kind of commonplace again. So QR code tracking is very easy. Yeah. Um, tracking phone numbers for sure. A caveat on these is if you're having a piece with a long shelf life, like a report, a book, something like that, make sure you keep the tracking elements in play for years. So keep that in mind. Um, and ultimately, then it's looking at the report. It's Lee Milt here, and I'm delighted to interrupt you today and let you know that I've been working with Stephen Oliver for 10 or 15 years now. He's a great guy. I love all the research that he does. And I just wanted to let you know that if you're enjoying the content on this podcast, then you really want to make time to visit advisorwealthmastery.com. And why should you do that? Well, because you're going to receive two of his great books and actually one of mine called Success is an Inside Job. You'll also get a lot of absolutely free material on growing your practice through effective marketing. So again, take the time to go to advisorwealthmastery.com. Putting on those monthly and adjusting, but we want those reporting elements. We want to tell them how to respond, track how they respond as best we can, knowing there's going to be bleed. Bleed is when they go somewhere else. So like something else gets credit, like Google gets credit or a radio ad gets credit. So there's always bleed, but there's also lift, you yeah. know, which is, which is the inverse. Whereas I did direct mail and I was on a TV appearance on the you know, local talk show. And now it's one plus one is three. So it, nothing's perfect. It's all fuzzy math and marketing. It drives people nuts. It drives me nuts. Uh, and that's why we really have to look at the high level metrics for making strategic decisions. And we look at all the tactical data given to us, realizing it's not perfect. Yeah. And, and by the by the tracking, just as so they don't understand the conversation, is you can put a separate phone number on the website where it tracks every, every um, um, call that gets initiated via that number. You can put a phone number on, on Google ads uh, and it, it tracks numbers that come through that ad, no matter where they end up. Right. So the, as you said, you can have a, a unique URL that has a code. It goes to your main website. It goes to a, your, your primary landing page, but you're tracking how many got there from there. And so what you're doing is creating reporting mechanisms to know at each stage where things uh, track through. You know, in, in my own case, the last three clients we we yeah. uh, we uh, uh, brought on board, they got to me by the most secu- circuitous damn route that you would ever have uh, have uh, uh, thought. Uh, one of them, a financial advisor, we had sent them a package, including a copy of my book about being on their website. And then they showed up at uh, uh, when Russell Brunson put together the relaunch of magnetic marketing. Uh, I was one of the speakers, so they saw me as one of the speakers uh, because they were part of Russell's list and then ended up at, with me back full circle from there. Um, and and I, I could go through three or four more stories like that where it was the most weirdest, weirdest possible route. And we know from watching our internal data with, with the CRMs, oftentimes they ended up on the list nine years ago. And a Facebook ad or a direct mail piece or something like that is credited with getting them to call right now. But the reality is there's, you know, 22 different touches that have hit them over the years. So it's, it's, uh, it's really interesting, but yeah, yeah so go ahead. I was going to say related to that real quick. So yeah. on some of our larger newsletter distributions, like we have a few clients that are over 10,000 pieces a month. Um, the ones that allow us to, we do tracking phone numbers and URLs on those as well. And, and the point of the newsletter is not to, call the office you know it's yeah. not a giant sales pitch however the header does have contact info and it's on the bottom of every page and when we track that and call record that i'm always amazed because current clients patients whatever the industry is that's the piece they go to to find the phone number like mm. there's a disproportionate amount of calls that go to that phone number that you wouldn't believe and you know, in the call recordings, you can go listen. And, you know, sometimes that's the referral piece too. So mm-hmm. someone new came and somehow got their hands on that newsletter. And uh, it's great because, you know, we preach newsletters, 
but it's also surprising that that's the first place they go because you think it would be saved in their their iPhone as a contact already. It's it's their guy. But, yeah. It's, uh, surprisingly enough, it's it's not. They, it's whatever piece is handy, and oftentimes that's the newsletter. I, I just had one of those too, where a piece I sent out got handed off three times <laughs> to to generate a a, a new client. Uh, and and you can never you know you can never uh, uh, plan for that or uh, or expect that. But there's all, all all the all the random angles that those things come out. Uh, well, at, you know, at the very least, I think we would both agree. Every advisor should have a direct mail sequence that goes out to every qualified prospect. And, you know, certainly if you have a 12 year old kid who's sitting in Pakistan and, you know, they opt in, you don't want to, you don't want to spend a lot of money at them, but there, you, there's any number of qualifying steps you can take them through, whether it's online or offline media, but you really should be following up with prospects. I say forever, you know, until they move to Afghanistan or, threaten to kill your firstborn if you ever mail to them again um and i mean, it, I, mean I mean that you will make someone mad mailing them eventually and you know that's fine just take them off the list well but on on the on the data collection part i think it's it's kind of backwards in the way uh that people think the thing that people are least concerned about sharing is their address it seems <laughs> mostly right and the thing that they're um uh, most annoyed with is is uh, you know calls that they didn't expect, and so it, it seems like the sequence of what I care about sharing and don't care about sharing are the least thing I worry about sharing is my mailing address. The second least is my email address, and my uh, the thing I I'm most concerned with I guess is phone number typically, um, and frankly the place that people are most likely to get annoyed is an outbound call to them or um, or um, um, you know getting email. Um, the email, you don't, you don't ever catch any blowback by it, but because they just opt out, you know, you put an opt out link, link in and they, and they, they pop out of it. But, but nowadays I don't see there's, I don't see there's that much opt out because people just aren't opening them and they're not getting there and not paying any attention anyway. So they just back up. Yeah. And well, every once in a while you get a mail carrier that deletes mail for people, but you know, it becomes news story. So yeah. Yeah. And we can all, yeah. I guess, you know, some people don't trust the mail. And there are issues with the mail. It is massive. And we occasionally find issues and we have to go hunt them down because uh, we can track to individual post offices what happened with your mailing. Um, the one thing I will say benefit of mail is the most stable media, like the rules can't change and don't change because there's just all these laws and bureaucracy and stuff. So once you learn to play within the rules, it's going to be very steady, stable, predictable you know, it's not like Google changing the algorithm on you to change something in direct mail world is a huge problem. Um, the only thing that changes, just expect the price to keep going up every six months. The uh, Postmaster General has promised us that, but yeah. that's fine. That's less players. We'll take it. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, and, and that's the main thing is, is for anybody who says that direct mail is dead, what all that does is create opportunity rather than uh, a problem, right? Yeah, is as long as you're in a category where the client's worth enough that I rejoice every time the price goes up. Yeah, we have to send out the letters that, oh, you're going up one, two, three cents, whatever. Mm -hmm. But yeah, and some people drop off. Mm -hmm. uh, however, that's that's fine. The ones that keep playing usually do better. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and the uh, I, I think people underestimate how much how much companies are still using direct mail. What always cracks me up, you know, having been in the Internet marketing world, as you have for years, is the amount of time that Google and other big uh, companies that are making their predominant money from selling clicks are actually using direct mail themselves. Yeah, uh, I use that in my prepared presentation. We have the pictures of the the Google mailings, the Wayfair mailings, eBay mailing, LinkedIn mailing, Indeed mailing. Yeah. Um, and it's not that their media doesn't work. I'm I'm not naive, but there's more consumer eyeballs to reach via other media as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, 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 uh, I think I stole from Jay Abraham, but I always talk about people. You should be doing a Parthenon of stuff, you know, sure. You should be doing email. Sure. You should be doing texting. Sure. You should be doing outbound, uh, uh, calls, but you should also be doing uh, direct mail on the media side. Sure. You should buy, be buying every click you can get, but you also should be in social media, but you should also be in, in cold direct mail when it's, uh, appropriate and in any number of other, uh, media in order to get that attention. Yep. It just seems there's 10 ways to get one client now instead of one way to get 10. And I don't think that's changing anytime soon. 
yeah, yeah. Hey, Justin, before we run out of time, anything that you want to uh, to add to that or any resources you have to share? Yeah, I mean, people can just reach out to us if they have questions. We're a pretty approachable company. There's you know 10 team members here. So just profit911.biz is our website. Um, if you have questions, schedule a consult, shoot an email. We're happy to help you. We know most of our clients by name here. Uh, we know the annoying ones really by name, but <laughs> you know, <laughs> we, we like to have fun. We we try and make this, you know, painless, you know, mail's not sexy. We try and make it fun. Um, we're here to get results, obviously, at the end of the day, but uh, it should be an enjoyable relationship for you. So we're happy to talk through anything you want to. Yeah. You know, and probably the, um, you know, the 800 pound gorilla oftentimes for advisors is they get, they get cowed in submission by compliance. But most, yep. of the, most of the things that I think uh, you would suggest, I know almost everything I would suggest with, you know, sending very personal looking notes, letters, sending uh, newsletters about what's going on with your community outreach and stuff. None of that is promising returns. None of that is, uh, is making direct investment advice. None of that is the type of stuff that uh, compliance has an issue with or, or would have any reason to have an issue with. And so really none of the strategies that we're talking about are, are things that really should be a concern with that. Yeah, look, we certainly had things shut down that we wanted to do before. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, the only sale you're making is trust in this industry. Yeah. And the things that build trust are you know, not really the return claims because they'll find someone else that's going to say a higher return. Yeah. You know, it's, are you a human being? Do I trust you? You know, what's, what's, are you involved in the community? Like, like all the things that make you an actual human being are really the decision points. Um, you know, they probably shouldn't be, but they are. Yeah. Um, so that's what we're talking about. I mean, even the newsletter. So we're not talking about the nitty gritty of what you do. We're talking about what's going on in your life. And here's some recipes and comics and jokes and fun. Yeah, um, yeah. That's it. It's just reminding them you exist and building trust. You bet. You bet. Hey, well, Justin, on that note, I think it's, it's been great. Again, uh, profit911.biz is, is your direct website and uh, Jurassic Marketing is the book. So we'll uh, we'll make sure we post all that stuff for everybody as well and then go from there. Yeah, shoot us an email uh, or go on the website. And if you want a copy of the book, we'll be happy to ship one out. Just give us your address. Sounds great. Sounds great. Well, I've really appreciated it and some good information. All right. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you.